<laughs> no, I think I suppose because we're both, I suppose we're both, we're both within relational activism uh, and we're both interested in um, different ways of helping um, individuals and um, especially in ways that are um, relationally um, informed and community orientated. Um, and so we, we, we wanted to um, be inspired and we wanted to hear about different ways of working and I suppose part of like today's webinar is that with new beginnings and fostering families both incredibly I think inspiring um, projects and it might not necessarily be that you can fully implement what they're doing within their organize within your organization but it well, you might be able to but it but primarily we hope that you feel um, you come away from today being inspired by the, the work that is going on up and down the country and there also there may be some elements or some principles or some aspects of what Boston families and new beginners talk about that you can integrate into into your work. Um, yeah, I think that's a really that's really well said, Rich. And we 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 did want to as well as um, yeah, hear from the uh, hear from the projects. We also wanted to provide that element of um, reflection on how. Um, yeah, how this project development work happens um, and how you operate um, inside and outside local authority. And uh, we, we have, um, originally on the bill, we had um, uh, Professor Gateskill, uh, who's written this book. I was just looking for it on my bookshelf. We can see it. A book called um, Democracy in Small Groups. And um, we invited him on because... Uh, he wrote that book um, a few years ago now, I think in the 90s, about uh, group work, group development, how to um, move along and get things done with groups of people. And there's that kind of um, collective group element um, in what you're going to see today. And I think that's an element of um, the practice that for me is really um, key and something that we're interested in in relational activism is how we um, uh, co-produce um, with groups of people um, and how we uh, link well with the community um, to get things done um, in in groups. Um, uh, uh, the professor, um, he was due to be in Singapore and uh, um, the time scales would have worked um, okay. The time zones would have worked okay, but then he's got either he's got a hangover because he, uh, and he's depressed that England lost the football. Um, but but seeing as he's American, I don't think that's um, I don't think that's true. No, no, he he let us know a couple of weeks ago that um, he would be he's now at three in the morning or somewhere now of where he is now. Um, but we um, he's keen to come to a later webinar, so we'll be catching up with him. Uh, later um but as rich indicated at towards the end and uh, the back end of the um of the session uh will um will provide some of those reflections um on group and and group development and it's true to say that i know there's some people on the call i can see on the list actually we've got um friends from uh telford and nottingham sheer as well so we have increasingly been working with other local authorities haven't we rich um i know you're from baines and my um from camden for the time being and um, but um we also have been working with other um organizations and and people around these um ideas and so we'd welcome uh, other um other conversations about that wouldn't we yeah it's probably worth <clears throat> introducing ourselves probably because some people oh, might yeah. have relational That's activism and some true. people might not have um, but just very briefly, um, re relational activism is a kind of loose cohort of individuals, I suppose, Tim and I and um, Carmen and, and a few others, where we're interested in the degree to which you can, um, or not the degree to which, but just the, the blending of lived and learned experience as a way of um, bringing about um, change and a way of operating within um, public services, particularly, with, and we're particularly interested in that within the child protection context and so part of what we do is i suppose we offer consultations to other local authorities or help set up projects within their areas and um 
but then we also do these kind of webinars, which is probably um, one of one of the most rewarding and exciting parts of what we get to do, um, because um, yeah, we get to shine a light on people who 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 we find inspiring. So yeah, yeah, this is the best bit for sure. I think um, for other people on the call that joined early, you might already know that I've got a pet seagull. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you join sort of on time, you might know that I live near a tree born factory. <laughs> That's all you really need to know. No, um, yeah, so I, I well, I could draw, I was going to say at the end, I don't want to drop a bombshell, but actually, I'm I'm currently working in Camden as a service manager and worked for, I've been a social worker for 20 years now. And originally, I was really working a lot in um, with Family Good Conference as a method and advocacy as well. And so, like, just hearing about um new uh, old not not new ideas is it but um you know really um radical um ways of working um like um a new uh, new beginnings um i just always really draw, drawn to that element of um participation and working with people um listening to voices from the community uh and um that mix of lived and learned experience so um yeah it's been that's been really nice and but i am this is my last week in in camden um shock horror so um but i'm going to be principal social worker in east sussex um from like august onwards and uh but we're we're carrying on with the relational activism work and and these webinars because as rich said that's the good one to come on here and and have a conversation and learn with other people and then um, while we're at it um maybe carmen could emerge from behind the uh the slide um are you there carmen do you want to say hello hi hi everyone how are you yeah i'm i'm good yeah. oh, there, you <laughs> there you are as if by magic yeah <laughs> would you what's your take on relational activism carmen my take on is i don't know I, <laughs> I'm just, you know, in the mix of everything that doing everything that we're passionate and we believe, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, yes. I'm common that I come. I have my life experience with social service many many years ago. So that I've been volunteer and then I start working with Tim and then, so I'm parent advocates and. I work with um, local authorities and doing research with universities and work with team and reach and others in relational like activism. So I'm I'm the person doing all these little things behind sending out emails. So this is me. Yeah, um, yeah. And if if you if you haven't already, then Carmen's um regular email is a nice one, and you can uh, sign up on the website. So if you just Google relational activism, it's there. Um, yeah okay okay well, that's, see that's, you. that's that's magic see you later <laughs> thanks for popping in <laughs> um all right well we've got claire and lisa here um from new beginnings haven't we rich and um as we flagged earlier um this um we really wanted to have a conversation with some people that were doing um work um in community and and claire and lisa you've been doing that for uh really quite a long time now haven't you how long has um new beginnings been going um so we've been going since 2018 that was when we did our pilot in stockport local authority so golly okay wow that's wonderful and, and um did you want to um introduce your uh, roles and what you do yeah, so I'm the post-program support worker. I started working with New Beginnings in October of 2021. Um, that was after I had completed the program. So prior to that, I, you know, had the lived experience of being a mum in and out of child protection since 2009 to 2021. So 12 years in and out of child protection and, um, you know, my children floating in and out of child protection as well. So it was quite a significant sort of journey for me. Um, and when this job came up, I kind of jumped at it because I felt like the program changed my life and I wanted to be a driving force to give that opportunity to others. So my role is I shadow the parents as they go on our program. And then when they leave, I'm their point of contact where they can remain involved for however long and they don't have to tell their story all over again to a perfect stranger because I've been on that journey with them um so yeah that's kind of what I do 
Wow. That's brilliant. And, and Lisa? So I joined New Beginnings two years ago. It feels like I've been there forever. I'm um, a frontline social worker on secondment from Stockport Local Authority. Uh, I've been a social worker for eight years now. And before that, I was 10 years as a family support worker for the local authority. So I've seen all sides of, of children's services. Wowee, okay. Um, so we've got the, the mix of lived experience right here. Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, yeah, what, do, did you want to sort of um, tell the story and, and say a bit about um, what it is you do? Um, so we, as I said, started in 2018 um, on the back of research that our CEO and founder, Dr. Yadwiga Lee did. Um, and she would love to be here today, but she's sunning it up on holiday <laughs> her. um so we're here to sort of talk on on sort of what it is that we do and and how we got started but the she went and did some research in north belgium um to see what provisions they were doing there that perhaps we weren't doing in the uk um and what she found was parents and families got sort of like a better advantage if they had that it's called the maternal commons where they share their experiences with each other and, you know, give advice to each other, but also more advantageous for families to learn how they got to where they are rather than what it is that they're doing wrong. Um, so it was all about starting at the beginning, starting about their past, their childhood and how that ironically, but also in a way that makes sense affects their children. Um, so New Beginnings was founded off of that. And since we started in 2018, the program has changed dramatically. Mm. Um, I mean, even from when I did it, we did get forced to go online during COVID um, in 2020, which I think everybody did. And luckily that worked for me because I was very sort of agoraphobic and wouldn't go out. So the online groups worked really well. We've since found that face-to-face -face works better now. Um, so we are moving back into face to face, but we've had some fantastic support along the way. We've had funding from Big Lottery. Um, we've had a fantastic relationship with Stockport Local Authority that has, you know, helped us to expand on the team. So, yeah, it's it really is truly fantastic. And Lisa, who runs the program, can talk about what it is specifically that the program does. Yeah. So we're a, um, an attachment trauma formed service. And I suppose one of the main visions of New Beginning is to break the cycle of intergenerational trauma. And how we do that is parents are referred in generally from children's services. So they've always got a, um, children's services involved at CP to PLO level. And um, we're a 24 week program. Um, each we have an, a group work. We do group work with a group of women. We've had to split it up because we have so many referrals. I think this time we're due to start in September and we've got 58 referrals already. And there's only two social workers and Claire and Yad that work on the team. So we are expanding as a team. Um, so we do a 24 week program where we have a subject that we discuss each week. To, and that can be from trauma to communication to, um, I can't think of other subjects, naming your own bullshit. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we have a subject. And what, what I try to do when I facilitate the group is to get the, the women to support each other and share their stories. And it's a slow burner, isn't it, Claire? And by the end of it, everyone is like really good friends. And alongside that, we run, um, we do one-to-one -one key working sessions. And in the key working sessions, we do adult attachment interviews, uh, systemic geneograms and timelines, which we get information from the adult attachment interview and then we revisit it with the timeline. And the, so the reason for the timeline is lots of our parents who've experienced trauma their whole life is a big muddle in their brain. So the, the timeline helps them organise what happened, when it happened, how they felt at the time, how they survived, whatever trauma it is they've experienced. Um, so that's what we do for the 24 weeks. And then the best part of New Beginnings is that we don't say goodbye to them at the end of the 24 weeks. We pass them on to Claire 
who has got so many families at the moment. We're going to get a new um, post program support worker as well, aren't we, Claire? Because there's just so many, and we become like a big family. We become like a transitional attachment figures for for many of our mums. And um, what I find different um, in the work I do now rather than a frontline social worker is I'm not instantly hated or feared because I don't have the power to remove children and I think through that alone we get we build up really good um, relationships with the mums that we work with and the dads because we do also have a dads group and I think we're the first people that they've trusted for a very long time yeah, it's an absolute honour and a privilege to work for New Beginnings and these amazing parents So that's it in a nutshell. That that's amazing, and and it, and it, in that um, process, then, so when you um, pick people up after twenty four weeks, which is that those relationships over twenty four weeks must be really forming, and that must be really yeah. exciting. Yeah. Um, but there's that continuity when they come across um, to you, then Claire. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, there's there's a huge theme when it comes to how New Beginning started and, and sort of like the gap that there is in service provision. And every time I sort of like look back at, at journeys, it's the same word over and over and over again, and it's time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I remember I experienced was going through child protection and someone saying, you're dotting all the I's, you're crossing all the T's, fantastic, we're going to step you down. And it felt like the rug was pulled out from underneath me. All of the support that had been in place, all of the agencies that were involved, they all just vanished in the blink of an eye. And then it was like, okay, do this yourself. And I could not do it myself. Um, and then I would inevitably end up back on child protection. Whereas with new beginnings, we don't do that. You know, we don't sit there and go, okay, 24 weeks off you go, because it's less than six months. And when it comes to trauma that you may have experienced, when it comes to doing the work, that's nothing. That's a drop in the ocean. And people need time. Um, so that's what we give them is we give them time and it's the most powerful gift you can give in child protection, I find. Mm. And it yeah, I, I the the trauma informed is a is a phrase that's used a lot, isn't it? And as a sort of time, as a trauma informed response, um, seems to be a really um a powerful response. But also, you mentioned the timeline, Lisa, mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. And um, what's that experience like of working with people on their on their timeline? Well, we um. We first introduced it um, a couple of cohorts back and the the reaction from the mums was just absolutely amazing because they were able to, as I say, put their life in order and there was lots of things that they've gone through that they didn't know whether it was bad, if whether it was normal because intergeneration, that's what happens in your family. Like for instance, domestic abuse, oh, I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't know it was that controlling or I didn't know my mum shouldn't have done this to me. So um, it's a real, and it's a real slow process. And um, if it goes over the 24 weeks, we will carry on. We have to go at the parents' pace. And we've had mums rewrite their timeline on rolls of wallpaper. And it just means so much to them. Because I don't think anybody uh, in their life has started at the beginning and ended up at the end of where they are now. It goes right through. Yeah, that's, um, sorry, Rich, you go. Yeah, it's just reminded me um, when I did some research into peer parental advocacy in the US, they have um, something called Parents Anonymous, mm -hmm. which is obviously it's a similar kind of idea to Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's for parents where they meet regularly and they, they share and support one another around parenting issues, parenting dilemmas, and it's peer led. And um the, the average length of attendance at um, Parents Anonymous was like six months. Mm -hmm. And I just find that's really an, a really interesting insight into when people are voluntarily given the option to engage with a support service, what's the kind of average length of time and how you then compare that to many of the service provisions that are made available for parents in child protection, which are kind of six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, if you're if you're lucky. 
Um, I wanted to ask something as well, because as the 24 weeks, which is a long time. It's a long time. Um, yeah. And then what, what happens on a, like, how many times do they have to attend during each week? And um, and what kind of activities are you doing with one another during that time? So uh, we follow the program it, mm. and that's the group work that we do. And each week we have a different subject. We hope that the parents can co go attend every single group if possible, because you miss out on a subject. And that's a really important time as well for them. For, I, I work for the mums and it's a really important time for them to gel and to realize they're not on their own. It's really amazing to see the, the group form as it goes along because it's like, oh my goodness, that's happened to me. I didn't know that anybody else had that. And then we do the one-to-one -one work, which we do perhaps every, at the beginning we have, a lot more parents that we do in the end we do have some drop-offs because it's a lot of work and it's a long time to invest in that work and some people just aren't ready so um, we do have drop-offs so we generally do about two hour key work sessions weekly or every other week depending on how many parents we've got there there's something I forgot to mention we've also we used to have a workbook that we you that the parents did at home that run alongside each of the subjects that we talk about and um, when I came it was really academic and I could hardly read it Yad is very academic and we I was like this is absolutely rubbish we need to think of something better and we now have um, for the last cohort we have an, an, an app on the phone so people can record they don't have to write down and record what they want to say um, in line with each subject that we do on the um, group work. Yeah, your point about um, that that sense of uh, isolation that parents yeah. can sometimes experience, because you can sometimes be led to believe that you're the only person that's ever experienced this particular type of problem. And mm. there's um there's a book by um, Polly Curtis, who's a, a journalist called Behind Closed Doors. And one of the things that she talks about is there's like everybody knows about what, what the toxic trio um, you know, alcohol, um, drug and alcohol misuse, domestic violence, and mental health. But she she argues that the fourth one should really be um, isolation. And that, yeah. and that does make a lot of sense because whatever problem you have, isolation almost guarantees to make that a worse experience for the individual. Um, and yeah, that... after, after the group, we have um, a WhatsApp group that all the mums can join. And it's just, I have to have it on silent because it fires off all the time. And they continue to support each other. And if they're having a bad day, they'll put it on the WhatsApp and someone will step in and they meet up for coffee. And there's always something giving away, isn't there, on there. So that's really nice. That continues. And real friendships are formed through it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know when I entered the cohort, I had zero friends and I know that that sounds like impossible, mm. but I, I really had no friends whatsoever. And when I left my cohort, I left so close to two of the mums that Yad nicknamed us the Twisted Sisters um, because <laughs> we were just so, so close. And it was the first time in my life that I had friends and I was 38 at the time. So it, it sounds kind of sad, but at the same mm. time, when I say it changed my life, it's not hyperbole you know it, it's definitely <laughs> definitely something that's life-changing and Claire could I ask what because you mentioned at the beginning when you introduced yourself that you'd had lots of support your children had been on child protection plans previously yeah how how did this how did the support of new beginnings differ from the other forms of support that you'd previously had um, I thought that I kept going back on child protection because of the relationships that I was in, along with my children have additional needs, both of them are special educational needs. Um, and I thought it was the relationships that I was in. What New Beginnings did was it said, not because you're in these relationships, it was how are you getting in these relationships? Mm. And so starting at the beginning of my life, at my childhood, and understanding that, you know, there is this massive fear of abandonment, there's this massive fear of rejection. So I would be very vulnerable and that would lead me to ending up in toxic relationships that weren't good for me that then messed up my mental health that then caused me to drink it's this huge domino effect that you don't if you move one domino out the rest of the chain can still fall so it's about not pushing the domino in the first place if that makes sense and 
so were you um unaware that the the way some of your experiences in your childhood had led you to develop certain ideas and beliefs about yourself and that was what was driving you into some of these unhealthy relationships were you completely unaware of that prior to new beginnings I thought I had a golden childhood I I walked into that core group and I remember thinking gosh why am I here I feel like I stole a chocolate bar and I'm in with a bunch of murderers like that was literally how I looked at myself at the time and it was really judgmental of me but I thought my childhood was golden and the more the weeks went on and the more that I spoke about it the more people were like Claire you were abused and I was like was I and then suddenly it was like oh yeah oh mm-hmm. that explains a lot oh and then it was it, it was very world rocking at the time because you can live in denial sometimes and only see yourself as the problem and then realize actually that wasn't my fault actually mm-hmm. that's not true okay and then it just flips your perspective of the world yeah it's it's a really interesting point there's some parents that that I've worked with where that the difficulties in their childhood were so um, emotionally or psychologically challenging that they kind of learn to block them out yeah. and and then by doing so they can then represent their childhood in an entirely positive way um, um, if they kind of overlook all of the different ways that they were harmed or, or uh, rejected or whatever mm-hmm. it might be um, yeah yeah, and it wasn't really, sorry sorry Lisa sorry. it wasn't even malicious harm that's the thing like my parents loved me and they did the best that mm-hmm. they could um but they're a product of their parents and so on and so forth and that's what we mean about intergenerational trauma is that new beginnings has broke the cycle for my family and my children are now far better off with their prospects for future than I was because suddenly I understand and they understand I was just going to add to that in the timeline also um, when parents realise that they have experienced trauma we also support the parent to understand their parents timeline to understand why they were parented as they were just so they can see another person's perspective because you have people that deny their childhood or you have people that say it's everybody else's fault and don't take anybody else's perspective so through the timeline we explore parent their parents timeline as well and what what we hope is at the end of new beginnings that they continue to be a detective in their own story so they can continue to build on what they've learned and that's done through the support of Claire they come back they can come back to any of us can't they to to carry on talking because we also we're constantly changing new beginnings to fit the need of the of the families that we are working with and we do that through groups so we have um we notice that a lot of the mums have experienced domestic abuse either as a perpetrator or as a survivor as they like to be called so we run a dis- domestic abuse support discussion group we also noticed that the last cohort i think we had five babies just born or born on the cohort and realized that a lot of the mums had had children removed from in the past and didn't feel comfortable going to the general mum and baby groups so we've started a bet mum and baby group we've just started a hoarders group and um we do life laundry which um my colleague matthew does and claire will explain what life laundry is because i don't go to that one yet yeah, so life laundry is um it's basically dialectical behavior therapy inspired um workshop that Matthew runs and it can either run thematically or the group can come into the room and we can suss out that somebody's got a problem, identify what their problem is, and then use tools from a toolbox to help educate. I think he called it psychoeducation. So yeah, that's that's what um life laundry is. And we also do run smart groups because we have some trained mm-hmm. smart facilitators to help with uh addictive behavior. So we do kind of throw a net out there to address a lot of the problems that exist within the child protection system at the moment. Mm-hmm. I really like the um that uh, language that life laundry is uh because <laughs> the language point is important isn't it because it, it feels like you're not moving away from the trauma informed and the um um some of those research or academic fundamentals but you're developing um a relatable language um 
around it and a bit of fun a bit of a fun language as well which i think is important that's part of being inclusive isn't it being creative and, and fun and, and humor is really part of that yeah as well um we we've got a, a question here from uh rachel who says um can families remain on the program even if interventions increase um and she mentions uh, children becoming looked after or if there's a, an increase in the risk or level of intervention um, um the authority side yeah so if i mean if the child does go into care and the parent doesn't have any further children in their custody then we do tend to pass them on to another agency in stockport called comma um and that helps that's more specialized towards parents who have lost their children because what we found in the past is that when parents do lose their children they're still in these groups with parents that still have their children mm -hmm. and it's a very very painful experience for them and they will inevitably just drop off our radar so we make sure that they are supported and signposted to the right place that will look after them but no we can have somebody from tac3 i believe is is the team around the child three mm -hmm. is the minimum threshold and then once they've been referred in however far their case gets sort of escalated we still remain with them and we do do some work with them um with regards to plo and proceedings and things like that mm. thank you for that and uh they the, it's on the q a we're grateful for the responses and people uh discussing that element of of time um and um douglas referencing the promise in scotland which mm -hmm at its 100 days of listening um, uh, promise. Um, yeah. Anna, Anna is, is saying that, well, in a culture of short-term interventions, um, you know, 28 weeks or longer should be more standard. And even 28 weeks is that um, long enough for these big questions about identity and belonging. And um, But I think you're, what you're talking about is that offer of connection and belonging over a longer um, yeah. Yeah period of time and you, you mentioned um family earlier as well lisa yeah 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 we are we are that the mums do say that it's our new beginnings family which is really lovely and what's even nicer is we've literally just got our own premises so we're hopefully oh, that, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're hoping that people will be able to pop down you know if ever they need to because a lot of our mums and dads go through crisis quite a lot and just need that that person that connected person that knows them to go and support them and they even there's they even go to whichever person on the team that they think is going to fix their problem quicker or you know listen more so that's really good as well because we're all different personalities and we all know all the, all of the parents yeah I think and we found that in our work the ability to sort of match or that that mix of um of personality is important to that's part of the relational element of the work yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah the, definitely, the, definitely. That, that as well yeah wow we well rich i mean that that was um phenomenal thank you so much for coming and um and telling the story so vividly and so honestly um and um and so well like we really we really appreciate it and, and stay on the call because um yeah, there may well be other questions or things that arise um, from the other um, speakers. But that was great, wasn't it, Rich? Yeah, really impressive. Thank you, uh, Claire and, uh, and Lisa. Yeah, it's really lovely to get a, a window into to the work that you do. And um, yeah, I'm especially interested in the, the, the level of, um, I suppose, support and uh, uh, therapeutic intervention that you offer people over a prolonged period of time and the importance of um uh connection be it being central to that really um so we're now going to um hear from um fostering families who are based in Bath and North East Somerset Council uh which is also where I work so they're my colleagues and um I'll let them talk about um fostering families and what it's about and what the intentions are um yeah I'll hand it over to you guys Hi, yeah, thanks for having us. I um, it was so interesting to hear about new beginnings. Um, it feels a bit like we've got a kind of kinship connection because there's a real lot of similarities. I think particularly with ethos and the approach that's taken there. And I did hear it as a personal invitation when you said you had a premises that you could, <laughs> what people could pop into. I immediately thought, oh yeah, we're 
back up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Zoe, I lead here on Fostering Families in Baines and I'm joined by Peter and Anna who are the social workers in the Fostering Families team and Sam who's one of our Fostering Families carers. So we'll each share a little bit about Fostering Families. I think just starting with how it came to be because I, I, I think I'm right in saying it's quite a unique service to have sit within a local authority. Um, there are lots of really exciting and inspiring services, often maybe external to the local authority. But I think one of our aims when this was established was to show that it is possible for um, this to exist and for maybe us to expand the support and that we can provide to families, especially long term. Um, so we always like to honour where it kind of came from because we didn't name it ourselves. It was um, initially named and the concept sort of started it. It was a paper written by Dr. Patricia Prittenden and Dr. Steve Farmfield, um, who within that really highlighting, I think, the impact of separation and the trauma that is often followed for the families, for workers, wider family, um, and a lot of issues that children in care face, particularly if they're moved between different carers multiple times, um, and especially with shortage of foster carers um, within the UK, which has been sort of growing since that paper was written in 2007. Um, and I met Rich when I, we worked together in uh, the child protection team in Baines going back, well, actually it might be about eight years ago now. Um, but Rich kind of introduced me to Patricia, the work that Patricia Crittenden did um, in the masters that um, in her model of attachment, the dynamic maturation model. And um, there's a course at Roehampton that Rich was undertaking when we worked together. And in his role as a community based parenting assessor, he had, I think, this idea about fostering families and this paper in mind. Um, and could see the potential for a mum and two children that he was working with at the time for a service like fostering families to really be the difference between the children remaining with their family or being removed into foster care. And a bit like we've heard, there was the in, link to this parent was somebody that had had generations of trauma, separation occur in their life. And I think this provided an opportunity for something to be different for that cycle to be broken as Claire was talking about. Um, so Rich did a quite a unique piece of work with this family and went into this home for over 10 weeks, I believe, um, every day working with this mum on goals that she set herself alongside Rich. Um, and they really got down to it and just worked rapidly on the home things that would make a real difference to this mum in particular and the things that she felt would be of benefit. Um, and we are really lucky because Baines, I think, saw that approach. It it took, you know, one social worker to say, I'm going to do something unique, I'm going to do something different. And for our managers and senior managers to, to see that and the scope that that had to, for us to widen that out more broadly and make that available to not just one family, but to multiple families. Um, particularly where there's a need for long-term support and where the difference of having one person in their life gave a shit about them, really could work, be with them in their life, working through the difficulties that they had um, for a, a long period of time beyond two years. Um, what, yeah, what difference that would make and how that could break those cycles of separation and the trauma that comes with um, removing children into foster care. Um, I think that's sort of where we began. And three years ago now, we've been going for three years. Um, Peter, Anna and Sam will tell you a little bit more about how it's going, but um, that's kind of what started it. And I think for me, what I'd love people to hear is that it does sometimes just take the act of one person and for some people to follow and say, actually, yes, I stand for something different and I stand for something that could really make a difference to families' lives. Because I think that's what resonated with me and probably most people listening here, although I can't see any of you because I've got some sort of privileged view. <laughs> I can only see myself talking, so. Um, <laughs> um, but I'll hand over to Peter and he will tell you a little bit more about kind of some of the approach that we take when we're working, assessing and matching families. Yeah, I wanted to share a bit about you know, what makes fostering families um, a bit different uh, in what it offers. I think that is what this webinar is about. Like we're just going to kind of Sorry. pop forward as we kind yeah. of talk. Um, so 
with fostering families, it's got the the word fostering in the name, um, but it is working with the whole family. So it actually sits sort of in between the world of fostering and the world of safeguarding, where the families that we're working with will be open to the safeguarding teams in some capacity. But we as a team sit actually within the fostering team. And that's where the service is because we have people like Sam, our amazing fostering families carers, who can um, offer this sort of long-term support. And it's based on this principle that, as Pat Crittenden says in her book, Raising Parents, that, that parents are the best resource that we have to look after children. And if we're going to care about our children, we need to care about the parents as well. And so really the relationship between the fostering families carer and the parent is the intervention. And then we're looking at what other gaps within that family unit that might be leading to some of the issues um, that means they're open to the safeguarding team. Can that fostering families carer fill? So you've got the relationship and then you've got the practical support that they're offering. And it looks like a fostering families carer offering uh, a minimum of two years for um, a minimum of 15 hours a week um, support to a family. And that can be during the week, weekends, evenings, that, that how that is provided is worked out between the carer and the family, depending on the carer's availability and what the need is within that family. And so that carer can then act as a sort of a transitional attachment figure for the whole family. So it's this whole family approach to fostering rather than this idea of removing the children and placing them in uh, with foster carers. And so it does offer an alternative to foster care. And um, there is still the, the the families will still go between the different levels of social care intervention. So like Claire was talking about before, they see their families through as they escalate potentially or come back down the different levels of social care intervention. We do the same. So um, they might come in at child need level. The family gets referred in by the social worker. Uh, it might be child protection. Sometimes it might be pre proceedings. And but whether or not that family moves up or down the scale of social care intervention, we remain involved and the fostering families carer will walk with that family through all of those challenges and the support will will still be that that same package of support. Um and it is it is a it's it's a journey for for everyone involved, and it there <laughs> there have been I think we've had one example where unfortunately children have still had to come into care, but we've also had just amazing examples, all the rest of them of actually that they have we've seen cases where the families move both up and back down on that, and part of our work is to try and understand what where does fostering families come in, in allowing it to um to the parents to kind of still function as a family and, and to find some kind of change how are we actually changing this experience for the family and a lot of the feedback we've had is that it is that relationship with one person who's a safe person that the whole family knows is consistent and isn't going to disappear from their lives and has that time protected 15 to 20 hours a week at least that they can offer to that family and often it works best for families that are quite isolated. They haven't got that from their own network. Or if they do, it's not helpful. It doesn't actually help benefit kind of their lives and the lives of their children. And really, it, it also expands the options available to social workers within the safeguarding and the court teams. So, uh, you know, like the, the example that Zoe gave of when Rich kind of first started this, he saw that this was a mum that you could work with that you could provide the support for and that might mean that if you could provide that kind of package of support those children don't need to go into care whereas at the moment if you're working in a, a safeguarding team or a team that you know has to take families to court you're often left with what are your options and you have to kind of scale them based on what you think is the best most realistic or the best option for those children and rarely can you actually propose an option that has a substantial package of realistic support that can fill those gaps um, within that family in a, in a way that is, is safe and sustainable and maintainable. And I think one of the things that you were gonna say, Zoe, was um, that we can be afraid sometimes within the safeguarding um, kind of culture, world yeah. culture of creating dependency. Um, I, what you say it much better. <laughs> well, I think what was unique about um, our sort of senior managers 
offering this outlet and expanding this into a service that now has um, 12 foster and families carers approved and we're supporting nearly the same number of families at the moment um, as and it's growing more and more it's it is the reason it's unique is because I think there's still a wariness to create dependency and yet what we always see is that a lot of families we work with are in the child protection system because they don't have a safe person to depend on and so really we come from a place of providing that and often find that there's there's people just like Sam in the community around families that we work with kind of ready and waiting but they just need a support and a structure and a, to be able to both meet the family but also wrap around them in a way that's safe and supportive of carers as well and it is so it's a minimum of two years and for that same reason that that um, New Beginning talked about as well, of it it takes a long time for change to happen, mm-hmm. or for families to be able to get to a place where they can be self sustaining again. And we also recognise within foster families that in some cases that might never be the case, but if you can provide safety, um, which allows children to remain living at home, then we should. Then we should. <laughs> and this is a way of doing that, which is also a affordable it, it does save local authorities money as well in terms of, if you compare that to um how much it would cost the children had to go into care not it's about the cost but that's a motivating factor for local authorities as well um yeah so there's a little overview of, of what it what it offers and how it's a bit different i'm going to hand over to anna now and then sam as well thank you um yeah so i'll talk a little bit about my role which is being a social worker within the foster and families team before sam then talks about her experiences as a fostering families carer. Um, So as Peter's already talked about, fostering families is expanding the idea of fostering to include supporting children at home. And what that means is that my role in the team is quite similar to that of a fostering social worker. Um, So it includes recruitment, assessment, and then supporting and supervising carers kind of ongoing. Um, Recruitment is really about finding people in the community who are able to support other families who are also in the community. So we've recruited some carers because they're already within the wider network for the family. Um, And we've kind of come in and strengthened those connections that already existed. In most cases, though, we are creating connections that didn't exist before. So recruiting carers and then matching them with a family that we think would be a good fit. Um, In terms of supervision, so we meet our carers generally about once a month. And supervision is a space where we can support carers to reflect on their experience in the role as well as anything that might have happened for the family. Um, We're always trying to kind of link those reflections to ideas of attachment. So thinking about relationships and strategies that both the parents, the children and the carers might all be using together um, and then supporting carers to think about, you know, what to do in different situations. The other thing that we do is supervise the match between the carer and the family by holding regular reviews with the carer and the parents together. And in those reviews, we tend to kind of reflect on their relationship and then agree goals for the time together. We've sort of found that that helps to keep focus and make sure that carers feel purposeful and supported to maintain some kind of structure in their support. Um, But the reviews are also a a space to kind of bring up and address any issues that might be arising before it can lead to any sort of breakdown in that relationship. Um, Because obviously we see kind of that relationship between the parent and the carer as being the key thing that makes this all work. So, yeah, I've been Sam's supervising social worker for just over a year, I think. Um, And Sam's been supporting a family for about two and a half years. She's matched with a young mum who's got two small children. I'm sure you'll go on to talk about specifics and stuff. Um, But yeah, Sam's role can have ups and downs. And I guess I see my main role as being with her, alongside her, during those highs and lows. Um, So, yeah, does that come over to you? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, so my name's Sam. I'm a foster and families carer, like Anna said. I've been doing it for about two and a half years. And the family I support is, yeah, a young mum who was, I think, 20 when I started working with her. And the children were um, one and two when I started. So, yeah, quite young. Um, I heard about the scheme and I just was instantly, like, really passionate about it. Because in the past, I was a foster carer, which I also enjoyed, but... When I had to pass children on to long-term foster carers, sometimes the matches weren't always great and it didn't always feel comfortable, like their identity would be protected and it would be a good fit. 
But luckily, um, the way we do things um, is obviously you have the assessment process and the social worker really learns about you and your childhood experiences and then matches you really careful to carefully to a family, um, which really helps you to build like a strong relationship with them from the start. Um, yeah, so I was really lucky when I first met um, the family things sort of just took off straight away and they really were up for the support. So I think within the first week, they'd allowed me into their home and said they wanted to have a mass clear out and we managed to clear out about 20 black bags full of rubbish, which I don't know, like a clear house, clear mind type thing. So that uh, her allowing me into her home and allowing me to see her sort of, as she called it, rock bottom. Um, yeah, straight away, like I said, it really strengthened our relationship. And then as time went on, obviously, we we meet um, three or four times a week normally. And the times could be really flexible. Like sometimes it'll be helping with school runs. Sometimes it'll be doing health appointments, helping with the house. And then as I got closer to them, I took the children out independently. And we started celebrating special events together, like, birthdays I'd host like little parties for them and things and now they've got like their own bedroom in my house so they have overnights when the mum needs a bit of time to herself they come to like my family barbecues with my so they my family now is like their extended support as well so um they've become really close to them and they visit their home quite regularly obviously with my supervision um so that works really well um I've done loads of sort of life skill work with the children and the mum. The children started to learn how to swim, like road safety, safety around animals. And, you know, I've got a dog and we've done lots of work around that. So I feel like I sort of, it's almost like a co-parenting role where, you know, I'm filling some of the gaps and then obviously modelling behaviours as well that the mum over time has started to um, adopt as well. So that's worked really well. Um, yeah, the, the good other good bits of the like I say the hours are really flexible. Um, that works well for me and for the mum. So sometimes I'll do a weekend and evening, and then other times it'll be days in the week. And we can change that as the needs change with the family, depending on what they want to focus on. Um, yeah, so one of the main challenges I think I found is having to deal with quite a lot of safeguarding concerns. So Obviously, because I'm so close to the mum and I'm in the home more often than anyone else, I have seen and heard some things that have been quite concerning. So they've had to be fed back. Obviously, before that, I've had to talk to the mum and explain to her about my concerns, which has been a bit of a challenge to then do that and keep uh, open and trusting relationship with her. But we have managed to do it. So I think that just shows the strength of our relationship. Um, I think another good thing with having like one family and a support and social worker is they really learn about your family as well. So I speak to Anna most weeks, even though we have our monthly supervision, she's always there at the end of the phone. And she, I feel like she knows my family really well as well. So I can talk to her about anything. I get really good advice. So that's really helpful. Um, we also have like group supervisions. So we talk about um, our families and look at different ways of doing things, get advice from other carers. And then they also learn a little bit about your family and we learn about each other. So that if any of us need to step in to offer support due to illness or holiday, it's sort of um, a larger support network for us as well. So, yeah, that's all I've got. So I hope that gives you a bit of an idea. Oh wow, that was beautiful. It took, re really felt like um, you know, we talked about language earlier, but it's really like helping. You know, it's like really like helping, caring work that you're you're doing. That was um, phenomenal, wasn't it? Yeah, it was so nice um to hear. Yeah, yeah, and I really like how um. You haven't kind of represented it as this kind of uh, in this line idealistic, like it's a panacea for all of the problems that we encounter. But actually, it can be in some cases 
the difference that that makes the difference for for children and does break those intergenerational patterns that Claire and Lisa talked about um, earlier on, and and the fact that you are bringing in people from the community to um, su support these support these parents, um, and and I, and I really like the point about the dependency because it we talk about you know like there's a fear of us of parents becoming dependent on the support services but then when you think about the alternative which is for children to come into foster care by default you're creating a dependency albeit with a built-in separation so you're just moving the dependency in a way that prevents the significant harm that's often associated with the removal of, of children from their families mm. um yeah it's, it's really lovely to hear thank you I think, um, you know, that standing for something different was really phrased, stuck out for me. And um, it in both the presentations, it feels like there's a movement there, isn't there? And a, a, a willingness to um, step outside of um, maybe more mainstream traditional roles or traditional as we see them and um, being conscious and just those as professionals there, your ability to... Um, to do it differently and be conscious of doing things in, in a different way. And the theme of continuity came through again, didn't it, Rich? And time, hu hu hugely, um, and and space and place and and belonging and how um, important homes are as well. Um, and the context, the environment you're doing the work in. Um, and also, and this really, and fits with with me as well that the 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 matching as well the f finding a good fit and allowing for um some relationships to work um better than others and finding that match and that fit yeah um really 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 fascinating stuff and um yeah i love the straight up uh, uh way you're doing it and talking about it i mean my eyes it's very interesting and radical and um yeah i'd like to try to share this with as many local authorities uh, um, that that i know that i think should be doing this yeah yeah i think first for just to add to that what we're excited about really is that other people you know we've really adopted the dynamic maturation model and use of attachment informed assessments both of the families and of the carers but i think in any which way i think people can I think we did stand for something different, but it has become quite mainstream here in Baines. There is no no real reason why that can't be the case elsewhere as well. Um, and we're certainly happy to talk to people and um, speak more about sort of how we've done things. But it doesn't mean people have to even replicate every single aspect um, because our authority is quite small. There'll be a lot of demographic differences between us and other, other local authorities. So I'm sure there'll be there's other ideas that people could input into this but yeah we we're excited that it could expand beyond Baines yeah we're Can always I come in? changing as well aren't we we're always learning and changing things so when we have our group two visions like yeah. we're really reflective aren't we like one of us will come with an idea or say that's not really working and because it's small we can quickly make change which yeah. I find really helpful yeah yeah I I'm yeah. Just... Yeah. I just can't stop myself you know the the more I'm hearing my my heart is like whoa it's <laughs> raising inside it's so excited you know and I really like it so don't think about you are from a small uh um, local <laughs> small space it's usually small space but they're, they're more so creative and doing big things you you get me and and I thought if if I have this treatment when in my case, I wouldn't have to go through all this trauma, you know, and sometimes it's not necessary to remove the children. And I think your way is demonstrating uh, you are supporting people. You are not the first thing to think about or how I'm punishing them, mm -hmm. right? And then to, okay, split the family up, break them up. Then I will do the work separately and then to repair them and that is just not good so then if if everyone could could start from the point that how i could add value how i could help them in this thinking then i think a lot of um 
unnecessary uh, uh, trauma or waste of resources will be eliminated in, in that space. And it's so good. And you, your, your practice is actually that's helping how to get into community, how to trust them, how to give them resources to, to help them. And I think the, the foster care go in there as um, a, a, a mentor for family and it's really good and help people, uh, family to learn. And then I think it's the whole process is actually bridging everybody to improve the relationship and working together. So rather than the traditional breaking everything, building barriers. So mm. I, I'm really, really excited and happy about well, practice. <laughs> and it should go everywhere. I might well, that, ser that serves as a lovely um, concluding uh, comment on the webinar. Um, we like to finish up, um, if we can, across the hour um, for lunch. But we're really grateful for all of those uh, that joined. We really appreciate it. We had 50 on the call earlier. And um, thank you so much um, to New Beginnings and Fostering Families. Um, we really appreciate it. If we can be a conduit to, I know Fostering Families were reckoning on a visit to you in um, in Stockport. So um, if we can uh, help that in any way, then um, just give us a shout. And um, Yeah, you're more than welcome. We would love to you to come <laughs> and yeah. in our new home. Um, I'll get Matthew to put the cattle on. Yeah. Yeah. I can stop for.